elementary student. Welcome to the Outdoor Classroom. My name is Rachel Dossi. I'm the director at the North Alabama Agriplex, and we get to partner with you on your great outdoor classroom. A lot of you guys have been here before, but if you were a rising second grader, you are new to the outdoor classroom. Some of you, if you came from Coleman City Primary School, you had an outdoor classroom there too, but you'll notice it's a lot different from here. At Coleman City Primary, it was pretty shady. But here it's really nice and sunny. We have lots of sunshine and grow different things. So today what I'm going to do is walk you through your different outdoor classroom learning stations and I'm going to show you how to take care of them because your class may adopt one of these outdoor learning stations and so you're going to need to know how to take care of it. Now in a normal year we would have outdoor classroom out here and we would show you to do this in person. But since we can't come on campus this semester, we wanted to try to do a video so that you could see how it works. So our first station I'm going to tell you about is our vermicompost station, or our worm compost station. So vermicompost is just a big word for worm compost. So inside this little box, we have worms. Now, today I brought some paper because they have been very um, wet inside here. Now we have worms for a few different reasons. One is so that they can compost scraps from the garden. Second is to feed our turtles. So we keep them going in here. In the winter time, we usually have to take them in because it'll get too cold for them. So one of your classes might adopt the worms over the winter. So inside here, I have a shovel to make it a little bit easier to dig in. We've got an old pepper. There's some old food in here. And then the worms that live in here are called red wigglers. And the reason that red wigglers can live in here is because it gets pretty wet in here. And so they can handle the wetness. Now what I did the other day was I came through and I put some sand in here and some paper so that it wouldn't be quite so wet in there. So we've got to find where the worms are hiding. So I've got some scrap paper. So if you're in charge of the worms sometime, you might come in here. Oh, there's a cricket. You might come in here and put a little food in for the worm, and then rip up some paper like this and just put it on the top. The paper ends up being their food, but it also ends up keeping it from being too wet in there. Because if it's too wet, your worms will drown. We don't want that to happen. So let me keep looking for these guys. And usually we feed about three or four worms to the turtle. See you there. You can see them in here. Uh oh, they're red wigglers. You can see why they call them red wigglers. You see them? And usually with the red wigglers, they keep living in here. They reproduce. You'll find these little yellow, they look like tiny yellow lemon drops. Those are the worm cocoons. And inside there will be three or four different little worms will hatch out. So they do that instead of having eggs. So that's a worm. What? So that's where our worms live. The red wigglers. Okay. So that's about it for worm care. You don't want them to get too wet, but you also don't want them to get too dry. So it's kind of a happy medium in there. And the things that are in there will keep composting. Okay, I'm going to hold these in my hand. I'm going to rip up a little bit more of this paper so that the whole thing is covered with paper. And I'm going to leave the rest on top so if some of y'all come and feed the worms, you can find this paper. Or I bet y'all have some scrap paper in your classroom too. Okay, the worms stay in here nice and shady so they don't get too hot. So that's our vermicompost bin. Okay, next we're going to walk over here close by to the turtles. This is our Eastern Box Turtle Habitat, and inside here, there are five big turtles and one little turtle living right now. They've done very well. Last year, those who've been here before will remember, there were um, six baby turtles. So they laid eggs and hatched six baby turtles. So you never quite know what you're going to find in here. Now inside here, they have a water source. They have um, what we call the feeding rock. They have... 
um, some different plants. These are some collard plants in here that they like to eat off of. There's also blueberries. And in the summertime, early summer, when the blueberries were um, fruiting, there was one turtle that would just stand right under there waiting for the blueberries to fall off. So our rules with the turtles is if you'll look at them, let's not pick them up or touch them, but you can uh, stand here and look for them. And unless your class is taking care of them, or taking care of them, we do a little bit differently because we want to find the turtle so we can feed them. Let me tell you a little bit about a box turtle. Here's a little guy right here. Now with Eastern box turtles, the red eyes mean that they're a boy. So red eyes, and they'll also have kind of a concave shell. That means they're a boy. Box turtles can live almost up to 100 years old. They can live longer than humans. And they keep their shell their whole life. When they're born and hatch out of a soft shell, or I'm sorry, a soft egg, their shell is hard. And you can tell their backbone, their vertebra, is in the shell. So they never take it off. Um, their markings are different. The boys are usually a little bit brighter colored than the females. Box turtles are our only land turtle in Alabama. So they're actually a tortoise. So they live on the land. They will get in the water a little bit. They'll climb in here. So what happens when we feed them? Can you see these feeding rocks over here? Maybe if I go to that one. You can you see that one? You can. Okay. So if we go over here, what I usually do is find the turtles so they'll know you're trying to feed them and then put like the worms on the rock. And then some of the turtles are not shy about eating, but some of them are. Sometimes you have to give them a little bit of privacy. Now along with feeding them worms, uh, box turtles are omnivores. So they also eat uh, fruit and veggies. So I have an old tomato here that's a little bit too soft. So with the turtles, you need to slice it into pieces because they're not going to want to eat it if it's a great big one. They like them in little pieces. Oh, he's going for another one over there. So we're going to give them some pieces of tomato. They also like any kind of fruit, but it just has to be cut up into small pieces so they can eat it. Let's see if he wants some tomato there today. And then we also have, in the big brown bin, there's some box turtle food. And so we usually try to put some of that out on the feeding rocks. Now the reason we put it on the feeding rocks is so that the turtles will find it. And besides this, so every day they need to be fed. Now if you came out here and there was a bunch of food that had not been eaten, you can take that and feed it to the worms. So we kind of have a little ecosystem going on here. I'm going to put a little bit more food on that one. And if your class is out here and they ever notice that you're out of turtle food, then you can um, tell Miss Ray, Miss Julie in the office, and she can buy some more for us. Now this collard plant, the turtles also like to eat collards. So we're gonna, oh, and there's a caterpillar on that one. Let's clip those up. And now, I'm also gonna pour a little bit of water into their pond. You want the pond to be nice and full because it evaporates. So that wasn't enough water, so I'm going to use the rain barrels right here. And this is the rain barrel that collects the water off the roof. It's the easiest way to get water in the garden. Now we can't drink that water, but the turtles can. So we'll let it fill up a little bit. And let's look and see if we can find a few more turtles. They like to hide in different places. Here's one in the pond. I'm gonna find it. This one, this one's also a boy because I can tell its shell is concave. We're 
we're going to put it over here on the other feeding rock because they like to have a little bit of space from each other. I got one, two, three. This one has a hurt foot. She's probably not going to pull it out, but it is missing a foot on this side, but it's always been like that. And this one is, uh, I think this one's a male too. Okay, we're going to put it on the other box. Well, we found four. Okay, so our jobs at the turtle station are to feed the turtle. Oh, here's the little one. He's probably about maybe five or six years old. I think it's a girl. So turtles take a long time to grow. The babies that we pulled out of here in the fall were just tiny. And so it takes them a long, long time to grow to be full grown. So this one is still not full grown. So we'll put it over here. It's usually a little bit shyer than the other ones. Okay, we found four. I think there's one more large one. So they like blueberries, strawberries, lettuce. Anything that's pretty soft, they'll eat. So give the turtles water. Feed the turtles. If there's any old food, you take it away. Now, the thing that'll happen with the turtles, right now they're eating a lot. But in the fall, does anybody know what happens with the turtles? They hibernate. They will dig a hole, they'll find a little place, they'll dig a hole, and they will bury themselves. And they will not come out until maybe March, maybe if it's warm in February, but they'll probably go maybe November, so we won't see them for November, December, January, February, March. Like five months, they'll be sleeping and we won't see them, and they're buried down under there. They don't drink, they don't eat. They're able to do that because they are reptiles, and they're cold-blooded, and that's the way they handle the weather. Okay, I think that's everything about our box turtles. So let's move on from our box turtle habitat to, can you see this butterfly? Oh, it was super fast. It was a butterfly that's called a fritillary butterfly, and we have a plant over here in our butterfly garden that um, has had a lot of the caterpillars from that on there. We're going to see if there's still any there. This is our butterfly garden, but really it's a host garden because the plants are here for the butterflies to lay eggs on and then for the caterpillars to eat. So what do, um, what do butterflies eat? They drink nectar, right? And so this is a morning glory that volunteered here, but we're leaving it because the butterflies and hummingbirds do not like to drink out of it. But what do caterpillars eat? Caterpillars eat leaves, but they eat specific leaves. So it would be like if one of you only like to eat hot dogs, one of you only like to eat hamburgers, one of you only like to eat popsicles. Well, you who only like to eat popsicles, if you were out of popsicles, instead of going to eat a hamburger or hot dog, you would just die. That's where caterpillars are. They're very specific at what they do. So some of the plants we have here, this one that looks really bad is because it has been filled up with caterpillars, and the caterpillars have eaten and eaten and eaten it. This one is called a passion vine, or maypop, and the caterpillars even ate the fruit. Can you see this one? It's completely eaten. That's a maypop. So when I came out here last week, there were probably, I don't know, 30 or more caterpillars on here, and they have all finished eating. I don't see any more. And turned into chrysalises. 
and then they will make the pretty orange fritillary butterfly. I'm just looking to see if I see any more. Now the other plants that we have in here for caterpillars, we have milkweed. Who knows what butterflies lay their eggs on milkweed? Do you know? Monarchs. And we have several different kinds of milkweed. We have this milkweed right here, the common milkweed. I'm just looking to see if there's any caterpillars, because right now is the time for there to be caterpillars. This one is a swamp milkweed. I don't see any. And then rose milkweed in the front over here. And even a butterfly weed. So lots of, lots of different kinds of milkweed. The idea is the butterfly would find the milkweed, lay eggs on it, and then we would raise monarch caterpillars here. Um, we also have parsley that is home to black swallowtail. And then we also have this partridge pea that is sulfur butterfly-like. So, butterfly gardens don't always... Oh, there's a fritillary right there. Butterfly gardens don't always look beautiful because the caterpillars like to eat them. And they'll drink any kind of nectar. So it doesn't matter what kind of nectar they have, but it does matter what kind of plant for the caterpillar to eat. Here's a chrysalis right here that's not hatched out yet. Can you see it? And you can see here's one that hatched. So when the crystal, the butterfly or the caterpillars are full and ready to hatch, they find something hard like this brick wall. And can you see right here? That's the chrysalis right there. And then when they're ready inside the chrysalis, they hatch out. And here's one down here that's already hatched. I don't know if you can see it. And you can also see the dye that came out of it. That was the dye that was from the wings of the Gulf Fritillary. And so look, it made a chrysalis right here, and that one's already empty. So they've been busy. I see a lot of them. All those chrysalises. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Welcome to your sensory garden. This um, is supposed to engage all five of your senses. So hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and what's the one? Feeling. So this down here is lamb beer, and lamb beer is super soft. They call it lamb beer because it feels like a lamb beer. And it, it's really a thick weight, so it can make it through the winter time. Now, with the lamb beer, I have heard that a long time ago, instead of toilet paper, they used to use lamb beer. So do you remember during the pandemic when we ran out of toilet paper? That could have been an alternative. Now in the garden here we also have flowers. This is a Mexican sunflower. We've got some lantana. The bees and the butterflies all like to come to it and the pollinators. And they smell good. So they smell good to attract the pollinators. Now we also have over here one that's interesting to touch. This one's called horsetail, but it also has many different names. It's also called equisetum because it has these little equal parts in it. And it's called scouring rush because a long time ago, settlers used to use scouring rush to scrub their pans because it has silica in it. Now, we also can call it a dinosaur plant because it has been around since the time of the dinosaurs. It has no flowers, and it is an ancient, ancient plant. Now, you'll notice some of the plants have a little sign like this on it. Now this has a little QR code, so if your teacher has some kind of device they can scan the QR code, it'll tell you a lot more information about that. That's off the Alabama Wildlife Federation's Outdoor Classroom page. We have a little bit of a theory garden here. Another plant that the pollinators love is bee balm. Now this one smells good too. I like the way it smells, it's kind of spicy. But you, make, you can make tea out of that. If anybody's ever had Earl Grey tea? It's got wild bergamot in it, or the bergamot orange. And this wild bergamot is supposed to smell like a bergamot orange. So we, it's used to make teas in it. But when it's flowering, the bees love it. Now we have a few other things over here. We have another herb. We have lavender. And it grows so nicely. Oh, it smells great. Lavender you can use for satchels for sachets, for tea, for all kinds of things. Now look at this, there's a scouring rush that keeps growing. You can tell it just grows from the root. So we try to keep it contained over here, but it never quite does, so we have to weed it a lot. 
Now another one that you can see, if you washed it good, you can even taste it, is mint. You can use mint for teas, for bug sprays. Mint grows like crazy. We have a lot of things that are invasive in this garden. Mint is one of them. When we started it out, we put it in a pot, not even buried in the garden, but it still took over the garden. We also have these walking onions, and these onions, when they set their flowers, they make little tiny onions on the top, they fall over, and they grow new onions. So that's why we call it the walking onion. So this is the sensory garden. Um, things you're listening for might be insects or birds in the sensory garden. Okay, let's go over here to the strawberry bed. Now over here is a weedy bed that is eventually going to be a woodland wildflower, but right now it's just weed, so that one's to come. So hopefully we'll get y'all involved in doing that one. Over here we have our strawberry bed. Strawberries will produce in the spring or in June, and so hopefully these guys will keep growing and we'll get good strawberries in the spring. So we'll have to come back and look. Now we're constantly weeding. That's one of the jobs over here, pulling the weeds out of the strawberry bed. Okay, let's go over to our weather station. This time I'm going to have to take one screw out to get it off. So usually the rain gauge will be on here, and you can see how much rain we've had. This one looks like it needs a little bit of maintenance, so I'm going to have to clean that one off. There's a thermometer too, a big thermometer. So you can come over here and see today. Can you get a good view of that thermometer? What is our temperature today? Well, looks like about 86 degrees in the sunshine to me. So you're going to check out and see what the temperature is. If you're teachers, if y'all are working on weather, that would be a good experiment to come out every day and chart the weather. Okay, over here, we have our cardinal direction sign. And this tells me that this direction is pointing east. And if we were to go east, and we went 4,283 miles, we could get to London, England. Pretty cool, huh? If we went south, and we went 1,669 miles, we could get to Mexico City, Mexico. Now if you think about it, there's monarchs migrating we were talking about. They're going to fly to Mexico, too. Do you think they're going to go almost 1,700 miles? That's a long way. And then our west. I have to work to keep these little guys straight. West, if we went 660 miles straight west, we would get to Dallas, Texas. And let's see where we would get if we went north. Ah, oh, you guys probably have been to Huntsville before. 50 miles north is Huntsville. 150 miles north is Nashville. 613 miles is Chicago. So that's our cardinal direction sign to help us find our way. Okay, I think we've got two more, no, three more places to see. Our raised beds. These are our raised bed gardens. And we have a nine raised bed gardens. Um, we've been growing these since the spring and the summer. And we have all kinds of things in here. So now we have sweet peppers. We never usually grow hot peppers. These are a little mini sweet pepper. See these? And if you're a teacher, if y'all want to harvest the garden, y'all can harvest the garden and um, see what is ready to eat. Usually when we have outdoor classroom, when it's not pandemic, we'll come out and harvest and try to eat some of the things. Now this year, something interesting we're growing are these little baby eggplants. They're not much bigger than an egg. And that's full grown. That's as big as they get. You don't have to peel them. So we have mini peppers mini eggplants, and I think we have some mini tomatoes here. We have some yellow tomatoes that are shaped like a pear. We have some, some red mini tomatoes. And then we also have my favorite orange tomatoes. This one is so good. So look at this little mini tomato, mini veggie. So your garden is very prolific, and those are very tasty. So have lots of tomatoes that need to be harvested. We also have herbs. We have thyme, oregano, basil, all growing over here. All basil, this is lemon basil. Look at the 
genius. The genius have grown really well, and the pollinators all love them. We have some big potatoes too that keep growing and growing. So lots of tomatoes. Now, pretty soon we're going to take out this summer crops because it's already September, and in October we will plant wheat to make it through the winter, and we'll have winter wheat. We'll also plant some other cool season veggies. Um, we have radishes and Swiss chard planted over there. Now, over in this bed, we have pumpkins planted, and hopefully they'll be right by Halloween. Right now, it's just still the camp. Oh, but I see a pumpkin flower. Awesome. You see this pumpkin flower. Oh, and there's a baby pumpkin. You see that? So the flower will be pollinated by bees. And once the flower is pollinated, it will start making a pumpkin. So these will be orange pumpkins. If you look, you never know what you find. Here's some crazy mushrooms growing under here. Can you see these? A fuzzy brown one and some yellow ones. We never eat mushrooms in the garden, but it's interesting to see what's growing there. So these are our pumpkin plants, and hopefully we'll get a good stand of pumpkins for y'all. Okay. These that are growing crazy over here, this is our pollinator garden. So this one has flowers in it. This is a giant ironweed that are bloom in the fall. So in this garden, we try to have things that are blooming all year long. So there's always something for the pollinator. So bees, wasps, um, even hummingbirds and butterflies. And I want to show you this one over here. This one is a cross vine, and it has beautiful flowers. If you look at the shape of it, can you think what pollinator might like to get the pollen from this one? Hummingbirds. It's got a long tube shape. So this one's perfect for hummingbirds, but butterflies will drink out of that one too. So it's been blooming all summer, so it's one for them. Now the last station over here is our bird sanctuary. Now they like these big, tall, crazy plants because it gives them shelter. So birds, not only do they like bird seed, but they like shelter also. And so these bird feeders, we keep filled up. So if your classroom wants to be in charge of the bird feeders, that would be great. We give them um, black oil sunflower seed, which is kept under the pavilion so it doesn't get rained on. Make sure you always close it back up. But let me show you how you open these bird feeders because people have trouble with them. They're like a um, childproof medicine cap. You press down on it and then you open it. Press down and twist so it's not that hard. But this one opens like that as well as this one back here. Because sometimes people can't quite figure out how to do that one. And this one is a squirrel proof feeder, so if the squirrels jump on it, it makes it where the squirrels can't get the seed. Same way for this one, those are both squirrel proof seed feeders. And then we also have one that's just a regular one that opens. So, this is your outdoor classroom, and you can tell there's a lot of jobs to take care of it. We have to fill up the bird feeders, we have to feed the turtles, we have to harvest the vegetables, we have to water when it gets hot, you have to plant and pull up the plants when it's the end of the season for them. So there's always jobs to be done. Now besides the jobs to be done, it's a great place to look for wildlife, great place to sit, maybe write in your writing journal, great place to find a little quiet place and read. And so I hope that you will enjoy your outdoor classroom and that your class will take advantage of it and will enjoy it. So thank you for letting me come to your outdoor classroom today and I hope you learned something.